Okay, uh, this was the title King gave me, and I am the world's worst prognosticator. Uh, I'd be, just tell you that right off from the front. But I can, I can guarantee you, you can put money in the bank, the future of Palmer pigweed control will not be this in the future. And it's not even the present anymore. Two shots of Roundup over the top and go to the shed and we're done, or those days are over, they're never coming back, and it's never gonna be that easy again. And you know, going forward, um, I just kind of, a little story. Um, I was over in Middle Tennessee last night giving a similar talk. It was on resistant Palmer pigweed. We had a couple counties in, in south uh, part of Middle Tennessee, and we had several folks up from, from North Alabama. They are just now getting resistant Palmer pigweed there, and they're in that ultra denial phase right now. Remember where we were two years ago? That's where they are. And I had put this picture up there, kind of shock and awe to tell them that's, you know, this is where we're going, this is where we're going to be. The thing I go forward with now, and I, I really kind of worry about, and I'm, I've written in the Delta Farm Press here recently on it, is if we continue the way we are just right now, this past couple of years, some of these fields, uh, where we're going out with, I know several fields, Bob mentioned it as well, two shots of Flexstar over the top, uh, Valor followed by Flexstar. I know several fields that got three shots of Ignite over the top. That is not sustainable. Uh, if we keep doing that, two to three years from now, Bob Scott will be standing up here with a very similar picture, but it'll say Valor followed by Flexstar. <laughs> That's what we're going to be. There is no doubt in my mind. And I guess my take-home point for this whole talk, I can about quit right here, is the future of Palmer Amaranth management. It starts really this year, 2011. And the way it starts with everybody here in this room is managing Flexstar, Valor, Ignite. So it's here long term because we are going to need it long term. I'm going to talk a lot about these traits coming up, some of the new traits. We just talked, I had some questions on the dicamba trait, the 2,4-D trait, the HPPD trait. These are exciting traits. They're really going to help us, but we're still going to need to rely on, on Ignite and the PPO herbicides. Okay, future of Palmer Amaranth control. This is something that's been alluded to before, but I can't emphasize it enough. There are no new herbicide mode of actions on the horizon. Uh, that are going to bail us out of this mess. We always had another herbicide mode of action came along and, and bailed us out when we had a resistance issue. Those days are over. I don't think we're going to have anything come along that's going to bail us out. If we do, one of the chemical companies is really holding it close to the vest because we don't know about it. So for the next five to ten years, we're going to need to rely on these older herbicides, as I mentioned, coupled with these new herbicide technology traits, and they're going to have to go hand in hand. Uh, you start to hear, I, I mean, just the questions I get from the folks. A lot of folks are very excited about some of these new technology traits, and they are going to help us. Uh, we're going to be better off with them controlling Palmer pigweed, uh, you know, three or four years from now than we currently are today. But they're not what Roundup was five years ago. So what won't they do? None of them are going to provide the efficacy on larger Palmer amaranth like glyphosate did. Uh, we're just in the infancy of looking at these things. Uh, right now, I know Jason, myself, several others, we're going out and spraying Palmer pigweed at various sizes with 2,4-D, with dicamba, with Callisto, with Laudis, mixed with Roundup on, on these resistant uh, Palmer pigweed and trying to get a feel for what, what a system's going to look like in 2014, 2015 when these traits come out. And the take-home message is, by themselves, you're going to have to still be timely. You're going to have to spray them prior to six inches tall. Uh, even with some pretty healthy rates of some of these herbicides. Uh, it's not going to be like Roundup was when Roundup controlled them when they're two and three foot tall. We're going to have to be timely with them. What will they do? They are going to be a good management tool for us to, to manage glyphosate resistant Palmer pigweed and some of these other resistant weeds as well. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing them come on from that standpoint because we definitely need a new mode of action. And basically what we're doing is getting corn herbicides into our soybeans and cotton. And it's going to be a new mode of action. And it is something we, we, we can use, and it's going to help us out, particularly on the kind of that no man's land of Palmer pigweed, that Palmer pigweed that's four to six inches tall, that depending on the environment, you may or may not get it with Ignite. Flexstar's pretty iffy. Um, with these in, in the mix, you, you're going to control it. Here's the other thing on future of, of glyphosate-resistant weed management in the Mid-South. We don't just have one, one weed in most of our fields. And in a lot of fields in Tennessee, it's very common to find two glyphosate-resistant weeds, most notably mare's tail 
and Palmer pigweed. But you can find these others too, giant ragweed. Uh, and we got some of these others I'm really concerned about blowing up, particularly those two at the bottom, Johnson grass and Italian ryegrass. Those things where they've started and become a problem, um, that's all we need is, is, is tackling those. Plus, we don't know what else is on the horizon, what other resistant weed may pop up out there in the near future. It seems like we get one every couple years. We're about due to probably find another one. Uh, you know, who's, who knows what's going to happen as far as multiple weeds. And this is what you run into. Um, uh, this, is, this is what picture I took this year in, in Tennessee where we have glyphosate-resistant palmer pigweed and mayor's tail in the same field. It makes things more complex. Uh, typically, palmer is so much more competitive that it stomps out a lot of other weeds, but if the mayor's tail gets a good jump on it and you didn't get a good burn down, it's pretty competitive too. Unfortunately, they're, when you've got two of them working together, it, it's hard to come up with a herbicide program to manage them. It's a problem in soybeans. It's a problem in cotton. I took this picture in Haywood County last year. I uh, took this picture in Lake County this year. Uh, here we got giant ragweed and palmer pigweed in the same soybean field, both resistant to glyphosate. So it, it, it's going to become more of a complex issue. I think for the folks in Arkansas, it seems like palmer just runs over everything there. In Tennessee, we got a little more diversity in our resistant weeds. But regardless, it's, 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 we're going to have to have some changes. And these new technology traits are going to help. But again, we're going to need to rely on these herbicides we're using today. No doubt, I talked about several other weeds, there's no doubt Palmer's going to be the driver weed for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, it's just, it's, it's very prevalent, it's spread overnight on us, I think quicker than what anybody really, really thought it would, and it's very competitive. Um, a slide, uh, Bob Nichols showed a very similar slide to this just earlier, but this just kind of illustrates how, how quick it moved. In four to five years, it moved from basically five counties to over 200. Unbelievably fast. And it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's only going to spread more and be, go, be a problem going forward. One thing on this that we're running into, especially in Tennessee this year, uh, Jason did a really good job talking about activating uh, our pre-herbicides. We had a heck of a problem this year in Tennessee getting pre's to activate. Uh, early on, in some places, we had way too much rain. We got 18 inches of rain at Jackson, Tennessee on May 1. We didn't get residual out of black, you know, blacktop, uh, concrete. Uh, we had war roads washed away. The herbicide was gone. We had other places like up in farther Lake County, Dyer County. They were dry. They didn't get herbicides activated there just because it, it just got dry. Then they had to be Johnny on the spot and get a post over the top. And, and some of the fields like this one I took a picture of earlier, they just couldn't get there. And this is what you run into. I, I ran across this field and thought, wow, look at those soybeans look good. Those, those on the other side don't. Uh, and sure enough, that's two different farmers, two different fields, planted two days apart. Both had a pre on them. Neither one of them got activated. Didn't get rain one up there. I asked them when they put their um, Flexstar on. There was two days difference. And to me, this is where some of these new technology traits could really come in and help bail us out on these borderline too big a pigweed where we can maybe tank mix in a 2,4-D or a dicamba or a Listo, lotus, whatever's going to come down the pike, and I think it's going to help us out. On bigger pigweeds, I mean, we're still going to have issues. So what are some of these new technologies? I think we've heard about a lot of them. Uh, some of the ones that are on the horizon, and really they're here today, uh, the Liberty Link technology. It's here now, um, being adopted very readily. Bob mentioned that we, you know, we sold out of Liberty Link beans last year and before Christmas. Uh, this year I, I hear they're moving pretty quick as well. Um, my biggest concern with this is we've got to keep this technology viable going forward. It's still got to be, be in play uh, if we're going to manage pigweeds five to ten years from now. Uh, just some work, you know, when you follow a pre, followed by Ignite Timely, you can get very good weed control. Uh, you look at some of these other technology traits and you rotate those in there. We can have a very robust program that's sustainable long term with some of these technology traits instead of just plugging in one herbicide until it comes up with resistance and then moving to another. We do need to be timely. Uh, this was dual followed by Ignite on 80-inch Palmer pigweed. We burn it, it started to come back. Um, maybe with some of these new technologies, we'll be able to maybe tank mix something in with it, like a Dicamba 24 d and get something that's borderline too big. Because right now we don't have any options when it's 8 to 10 inches tall. One thing going forward, though, and I mentioned it from at the start, and I'm going to mention it again. If we're going to be using Ignite and spraying it two and three times on too big a Palmer pigweed, we're going to have huge issues going forward. Um, uh, if we lose Ignite and we lose the PPO herbicides, even with these new technology traits on, we're going to be worse off five years from now than we are today. And that's hard, hard to imagine, but I, I believe it is true. 
Uh, glytol, it's another technology. It's here today. Uh, again, the future is here now. Uh, the Glytol Liberty Link, uh, it's going to give tolerance to glyphosate and ignite. Um, it's got deregulated in 2010, and you're going to have some of them some cotton here shortly. Um, this is one of the first fields in Tennessee I ran across that had widespread glyphosate resistance. This was a cotton field in Shelby County. I was out in this field two years ago, sprayed three times with, with Roundup. Um, just absolutely nothing. Came back with Invoke. It was like putting water on it. Um, basically, we ran a hood through it. Direx, MSMA, Valor. We did clean up the middles halfway good, but all those pigweeds, they got up in the, in the rows. They lodged. They fell over. Big seed load, and that cotton made about a bale. 2009, same field. A little bit of difference. Cotteran Pre used a Pre, got that in play and put two shots of Ignite over the top and got very good control. Um, but again, we're going to have to make this system work. We can make Ignite work in, our, in both our cotton and our soybeans, but again, we're going to have to manage it long term to, to keep them viable. Some of the newer ones that are a little bit further off, and at some of these I'm just, uh, ETA is kind of what I pulled up from talking to some of the industry folks, and if you look at their websites, uh, the DHT trait uh, from Dow, DHT stands for Dow herbicide trait. It's going to be tolerance to several different herbicides in soybeans and cotton. The tolerance is going to be to the 2,4-D and Ignite. In corn, it's going to be to the FOP herbicides in 2,4-D. Uh, best guesstimate right now when you'll st start to see them maybe out there, uh, that corn trait, ETA 2013, soybeans and cotton 2015, but I think these things are a little fluent. We, you know, we're looking at the 2,4-D trait, and I'll just tell you just the one thing I'll tell you going forward. Uh, the tolerance looks very good on, on, the, on the cotton that has the 2,4-D tolerance. Um, unfortunately, if the Palmer pigweed gets 10 to 12 inches tall, the tolerance is, is a, little bit, a little bit too good on it. You knock it down, you make it mad, and in about five, six days, it turns its head back to the sun. Um, and it's something that, you know, I didn't expect going into this. I really thought it'd be a little more robust on it but it, it, it does do that. But if you could tank mix some of these other herbicides in there like an Ignite or a Flexstar, you know, we might be able to make it work. Dicamba trait, uh, soybean tolerance uh, to dicamba and glyphosates on the horizon, um, probably 13 or 14 cotton, uh, maybe 2015. Um, and if you look at the tolerance, uh, it's as far as dicamba tolerance in the soybeans, you're going to get very good tolerance pre-emergence. What you have there on your left is, 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 a, is a quart of... Uh, Dicamba pre-plant, the tolerant beans are on your left. That one row there in the middle is the non-tolerant beans. And also post-emergence. You're going to have very good tolerance uh, to dicamba with these traits. And as a, as a weed scientist, when you're spraying dicamba on soybeans and 240 on cotton, it, it just, you, you feel a little bit hesitant every time you do it. But uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, but it, it's, you know, it's almost like a miracle, kind of like when, two, when Roundup first came out. Again, with dicamba, uh, if it's four to six inches tall, 2,4-D dicamba will take them down and kill them. If they're a little bit taller, then it's, it knocks them down, and they kind of get woozy, and here they come back on you. We're going to have to have some other herbicides in there as well. Um, I know, Jason, I know several of us are just out. We've been just trying to brainstorm on what some of these systems may look like. We're on the very emphasy of, of looking at what these systems are going to look like going forward. Uh, but at Millington, Tennessee, where we got a highly resistant glyphosate resistant Palmer pigweed population, we just went out with some different combinations. Um, and I should mention the clarity in there and, and the 2,4-D in there is also mixed with, with uh, 22 ounces of Roundup PowerMax. Um, and this is the control we got. Uh, a pint of uh, clarity plus Roundup, we got around 65-70% control. A quart, we got a stair step up, up close to 80%. Uh, but you take mix an item with it, and you're getting it over 90%. Uh, 2,4-D, uh, here's a pint, got about 65% control. Here's a quart up near over 80. Uh, a quart with Ignite, and you're getting very good control. And I, I think going forward, that's what we're going to have to look at uh, is some of these tank mixes, pre's, followed by them. Uh, it's it's going to give us a very viable, and, and really, to me, uh, I feel very optimistic of what we can do in managing Palmer pigweed with these traits, provided we can keep Ignite, and the PPO is still in play five years from now. And that's really all up to all us in this room, quite frankly. 
Another one you don't hear as much about, but quite frankly, there's a couple companies working on it is HPPD trait. Uh, for you, that would be like the Callisto from Syngenta, the Lotus from Bayer, uh, but it's going to give tolerance to those. Um, they're look, being looked at in both cotton and soybeans. I'm not, this is my best guess. I have no idea if that's right. Well, we'll see it or not, 2015. Uh, all the weed scientists in the room were really excited about this. This was the last mode of action that came out, 1993. Haven't been, it hasn't been one since. Excellent pigweed product. And that gave us a lot, of, a lot of optimism about this thing going forward and being in a gene. And, you know, the 2,4-D and the dicamba, they have some baggage, and everybody knows just, you know, off-target movement concerns and things like that. Those are being worked on. I think they're looking at formulations and such, uh, and we'll see what comes out. I'm, I'm optimistic maybe they can get something that'll stay put. But with this trait, it didn't have that kind of baggage. I mean, that made it happier. The other thing is there's no, there was no known resistance until this summer. <laughs> And this was a killer for, I don't think it probably made the press as much as it should have, but when water hemp was found to be resistant to Callisto up in Illinois, that, that was a real concern. Uh, it's the first time we've seen resistance, and of course it would have to be in the close cousin of Palmer pigweed water hemp. That would suggest that the genes out there in the pigweed population, and you know, I've, I've talked to the folks up there, um, and you know, the, we were looking at maybe four or five years of Callisto being put on this field, and they had resistance. Uh, that's a concern. I was really hoping we wouldn't have resistance by the time this gene came out, uh, but we're going to. The bleaching type herbicides, a lot of you, if you don't grow a lot of corn, you may be not that familiar with them. Uh, I really like these herbicides for, in a, in our, uh, for pigweed control. Uh, we use them fairly readily. It was our number one herbicide um, used this last year, some of these bleachers in corn. Uh, I'm just going to kind of sum up with this. I probably said it way too many times, but I really can't emphasize it enough. In order to be successful with these new herbicide traits, we must, and I really emphasize that, we must keep Ignite an active herbicide on Palmer Amaranth. We've got to manage it. Bob said when you use it one year, rotate it out the next, or tank mix it. There's things we can do, and we really need to do them. Uh, and we've got to keep the PPO herbicides active in, on Palmer too. We've got to have both these herbicides going forward. I mentioned water hemp, the Callisto resistance in water hemp. The water hemp's also resistant to the PPOs up in the Midwest. Um, that means the genes out there in that pigweed, and as uh, uh, Dr. Oliver said, very, you know, they cross very readily, very similar in a lot of ways genetically, uh, and so you worry about PPO resistance too. And these are our, kind of our last stand defenses. We've got to keep these things in play. Um, you heard over and over on a lot of the weed scientists in the room, um, is Ford still here, Ford? I don't know how many... Uh, articles he wrote to Delta Farm Press, you know, shouting about Roundup resistant pigweed, Roundup resistant pigweed, and nobody really seemed to, to do much. Uh, we're not worried about Roundup resistant weeds anymore as far as the weed scientists go. We're worried about resistance to these other herbicides we're using now because we know there's no backup. We've got to keep them in play. Um, and, you know, two shots of Ignite over the top on big pigweed, especially if you got them separated by... You know, 20 days uh, applying them is, is, is really kind of a recipe for an express chain to resistance to those. I don't want the future of Palmer weed control to be this, um, where we're pulling them out of the field and, and, and moving them to Arkansas and dumping them, um, and dumping them in the field. We, we can do better than that, and I think we can. We can manage these herbicides and keep them in play until we can get these these traits to come online, and we should have enough versatility then to maybe be able to manage them long term. 